<clears throat> okay, so this is the pre-class video for class number 12 for the class on Wednesday, January 21st. Um, so we're going to finish up humanism and the Black, hum Af Black Lives Matter and humanism. And then I'm going to expand that. And I want us to talk a little bit more about anti-humanism, the people who think that uh, we should turn to God, that our foundation was based on belief in God, and humanists are anti-God and anti-American and anti-Christian. So this is the big culture war going on. And I do want you to be aware of it and all the different manifestations of it. So um, I think first, We'll go back to the assignment for um, Tuesday. And I still have four students who need to report their reactions. Um, I think Mary Hannah, Michael, Caitlin, Jason, Akaya, and Lakesney, I think. No, Akaya spoke. So Lakesney. So I think we have all the students. But I want to. Um, have you look again at the attachment that I, I asked you to read page 14 to 17. And this is um, by Lee Dugan about critical of humanism. So let me go over this. Um, the heathen rage, the people imagined vain things. We can redefine the family, control the earth's climate, abolish inequality by redistributing wealth and achieve bodily perfection via embryonic stem cell research, human cloning and genetic engineering. The collective term for all of these vanities is humanism and it's always been with us. In the Garden of Eden, the serpent produced the original humanist manifesto. It was a declaration of autonomy of, from God, and it led to Adam and Eve's immediate eviction from paradise. Okay, so he says, today, the way humanists operate, they are focused on creating a man-made utopia, they reject God, they embrace the state, they look to bureaucratic institutions, either through co coercion or persuasion or a mixture to redeem man from his self-destructive ways. It's a growing statism seeks to erode Christian liberty. Okay. Our justice system mocks God's justice by sympathizing with criminals and showing contempt for the innocent. Um, all right, so what's the disagreement, right? So on the one hand, humanists today, if you look at that plenary, planetary humanism of 2000, okay. So you've got the problem of climate change. All right, so the anti-humanists say, the humanists think we can control the environment and they're arrogant and they're playing God. The humanists say, we've been playing God forever and that's how we've destroyed God's creation. The motive is greed and fossil fuel billionaires pay the, for the political campaigns of Republican politicians and whoever has the most want money wins. They give those politicians the most money, they win and then they tell them, do not even think about creating laws to, um, to promote green technology or to inhibit the fossil fuel industry in any way. So there's uh, Charles Koch and his um, political machine. I've read 
a thousand pages about these people. I know their background. They were raised to be heartless. They, they're heartless billionaires and they're obsessed about maintaining their wealth via fossil fuels. And they control the Republican Party. But that is not emphasized. What emphasized is there are Christians versus humanists. So you can decide, right? Do you, that, okay, do you think humanists are playing God because they're trying to control the climate or they're trying to prevent us from destroying the climate? Or Christians are turning to God because they think God controls the environment. And if God wants life on earth to end, that's God's will. God can change it. All we have to do is believe and we'll be saved. If the climate is destroyed, life is destroyed, that's the book of Revelation and the end times. Okay, guys. <laughs> What's the middle graph? Well, we have some engineering to correct for what we've already destroyed. We have some green technology to try and get us back in sync with natural cycles. And we think that God teaches us to do this. God wants us to do this. As a matter of fact, God is furious because we're not doing this, right? So some people could think this is what God wants for us to unify, integrate culture with nature. That would be the, the between position that shouldn't be anti-Christian and it shouldn't be anti-humanist. But this is the rhetoric that's on climate. What about um, growing inequality, right? The problem of creating a middle class. Well. Ever since World War II, um, at the end of World War II, the European economy had collapsed. The developing countries were not developing. The United States was going to be the economic empire for about 50 years. Everybody knew that. Everybody with a brain. I was in high school. I could figure that out. If we don't correct for climate change, if we went green 50 years ago, we wouldn't know anything about the Mideast because we wouldn't need them for oil and nobody else would need them for oil either. They wouldn't have the power they have. There wouldn't be this war between Islam and Christianity. And that's not utopia, that's realism. We were ignorant. Um, living in La La Land 50 years ago, we did not change. What do we have? We have wars for oil. Um, we have all trillions of bucks spent on war, the war with Iraq. We have, um, we still have resistance to climate change technology. The Chinese are gonna develop green technology. There's going to be a race between us to see who's going to be able to sell the best product at the lowest price. And whoever does is going to control the economy in the next, I don't know, decade or two. Um, Bill Gates and about a dozen other billionaires have started working on green products. They've invested a lot of money, but it's a long process. Bill Gates did not become convinced about climate change until 2006, which to me is shockingly late. I knew things in 1968 and I'm not smart like Bill Gates. And I didn't live in Seattle. I lived in a backwater place. So that's very disappointing that he didn't know. But anyway, so the Christians will demonize Bill Gates. They already do, right? He's one of those horrible humanists that think he can control the environment. And um, Bill Gates just says, I don't understand politics. You politicians have to take care of this. I'm an engineer. Well, 
it's not rocket science to figure out the politics behind it. And I don't think, I think Mr. Gates is naive, but anyway, he's trying to get it, not only to get it, uh, the technology in place, but to get it cheap enough so that people will buy it, right? But the fossil fuel billionaires are putting extra taxes on green products so they stay expensive and tax breaks on fossil fuels so they stay cheap. This is really, this is really going on and it's really worrisome. But <clears throat> according to Mr. Dugan, it's just Christians versus atheists, right? Okay, so on the climate change, on the problem of creating a middle class. They reject God and they embrace the state. Well, given our, the fact that money sticks to money and that has been happening since 1980, all the data is there. Ronald Reagan destroyed the middle class. He destroyed the unions. Women went back to work, but it was all in the name of conservative values. So, um, so in order, to re, in order to bring back a middle class, uh, we need to tax the rich and provide social programs and opportunities for the underclass to work its way up. We need education, grants for education, so they can get the education they need for a middle class life. We need um, opportunities for economic development. There are government programs that will provide low interest loans for people who want to start a business. There we need, an, um, so there has to be more government intervention in order to have a middle class. We also need government intervention to, to address the climate issue. We need government intervention to address the housing issue because it was government policies and corporate policies that have led to this ghetto, ghettoization of people based on class, which is mostly race. There's a whole history behind that. So just to say we need government intervention to provide more opportunity does not mean that we're looking to the state for salvation. All it means is that we're not looking the other way and either to God or the rich CEOs of international corporations to save us, okay? Um, but that's the way it's presented, right? Stateism versus capitalism. Um, all right, and then there's um, the cultural sewage that comes out of our media and entertainment industries. Well, it's driven by profit. And capitalism is supposedly the best way because statism is terrible. So, so if you um, you know try to put some laws on what you can create with the media, that would be outrage. That's statism. So that's personal responsibility. It's not the liberals' fault that that it's you know, garbage comes out of the media and entertainment industries. It's whatever people want, they'll get in a free market. So they shouldn't be blaming the, the liberal, the humanists for that. When he says justice, our justice system sympathizes with criminals and shows contempt for the innocent. I mean, the subtext there is that you don't look at systemic racism you don't look at how people get into situations. You don't look at things like the war on drugs where crack cocaine was given way, way higher sentences than um, powder cocaine. Powder cocaine is the preference of the rich. Crack cocaine is the poor. And then you don't go after the people in the burbs in their mansions who actually get the cocaine from Mexico or wherever they get it, and then give it to the guy on the street to go sell. And that's the guy that gets arrested. So again, you've got this class and race division. And, um, and you have 
people who want to change the laws to make things better. We have to look to the government to change the laws or to make laws so that we don't constantly have this money sticking to money, which turns out to be white sticking to white, you know. And um, okay, then there's also the problem of abortion, right? Those humanists have contempt for the innocent. Well, what's the answer to that? Is that when abortion is illegal, the Republicans' policies, which are not to pay attention to poverty, the way to reduce the number of abortions, reduce poverty, teenage sex education, contraceptions, and then um, provide teenagers with opportunities so they can see a life for themselves so that they'll stay in school and they'll work their way up some career ladder. That's when they don't get pregnant, right? But Republican policies, increase poverty, no sex ed, no contraceptions. There are more abortions. Why do women get abortions? Because they can't afford another kid or because they're too young to have a kid. So the number of abortions goes down under democratic policies. I think it was the lowest ever under um, Obama. But um, the, this just persists, right? We have to make abortion illegal. So politicians get up on their stand and they talk about it. And some of them actually have affairs and tell their girlfriends to get abortions. <laughs> Mr. Turner, um, the guy who made it illegal to pay for abortions, uh, Henry Hyde, he had a four and a half year affair with a married woman. So the hypocrisy of this and politicians that get votes for being against abortion, but has nothing to do with their lives. They're not thinking like a citizen. <laughs> They're thinking about how to get votes. So citizens have to think, how do you save the middle class? That's not the way to save the middle class. How do you, the gun policy, right? It's never been confiscating guns. It's always been, um, you know, background checks, all these things that have been proven to reduce the number of deaths. Um, Republicans have set up a political party where the political brand, every aspect of it shrinks the middle class. As far as I know, I don't know any policy that, that doesn't do that. There's cutting taxes, right? And then people get more optimistic and maybe they'll start a business, but that's not long-term. It doesn't last. So Ever since Reagan, every time taxes have been cut, they've always been cut in favoring the rich. The deficit has blown up. Every time a Democrat gets in power, Clinton, Obama, they prevent the deficit from growing. They decrease the deficit to some extent. Every time a, a Democrat gets in power, the Republicans start talking about the deficit and fiscal responsibility. They're the ones that cause the deficit. So uh, I just think, and then, and then, you know, the people, the Democrats get accused of being these humanists that are trying to play God. Um, all right, so they, okay, they claim, these humanists claim that if we use technology wisely, we can control our environment, which is versus prevent disaster. We can conquer poverty versus try to save the middle class. We can markedly reduce disease. Um, well, we can certainly reduce some disease. We have a, a, a National Institute of Health, the Center for Disease Control, so we know that. Right, so the anti-humanists have been raving against the CDC 
and the Democrats during the COVID because they don't want to have to wear masks. They don't want to have to get a vaccine. It's government control of your life. It's anti-God, okay? God doesn't want us to have a planned program for how to deal with COVID. Um, okay, so the thing is somebody who unites reason and faith would say, of course, God wants us. God doesn't want us to sit and die. Um, so God wants us to unify reason and faith and to choose to do what will minimize the amount of damage. God wants us to follow the golden rule. God wants us to care about public health. So the whole idea of developing your awareness of yourself as a citizen is our founders thought was completely consistent with the golden rule, right? Treat others the way you want to be treated. And um, government policies are designed to coordinate with that. They're not replacements. Um, but when people with a religious background deliberately ignore science, that's when the founding fathers would just go crazy because the founding fathers would, did not agree with that. So, um, okay, so what else? Um, they accuse the humanists of wanting to um, alter the course of human evolution and cultural development. Okay, so I think that um, this is why I like classical humanism better because they did not think the basic survival drives were going to change. Every generation was gonna to have to create a culture that integrated those drives that dealt with pleasure and fear, like I've said. Modern humanism was based on this blank slate point of view and they really did think that science and social science technology, we could re-engineer human beings. We could completely change human nature. We didn't have to learn from history because we were going to engineer human beings in a way that is, that is so much better than they have been in the past. So that, that is a criticism of some kinds of humanism, but not not the, the standard founding fathers, not Martin Luther King, not, um, I think the human, Black Humanist Alliance is not anti-religion. It's just anti-science anti religion. Um, so he does quote from a book, a magazine article by an eminent British astronomer. So this is not the humanist position, right? He found a quote in a magazine by one person who called himself a humanist. And he says he proposed the construction of an artificial sun. Well, yeah, but that's anecdotal evidence. It's like, therefore, all humanists are trying to re-engineer the creation or something. Uh, as opposed to Christian humanists want us to integrate culture and nature. They don't, we are trying to re-engineer everything and that's what's wrong. Um, so, okay, I do think it's uh, a stereotype, right? So humanism is the prevailing ideology for many leaders in government, politics, education, journalism, entertainment, and even the church. Well, insofar as they say we, God wants us to use our reason for social justice, that would be Martin Luther King Jr. Um, and then it's critical, it, it's boundless faith in human reason, it's total inability to fathom human nature, wishful thinking. Okay, so um, insofar as enlightenment humanists, think we can socially engineer people out of sin. You know, we can socially engineer them so they don't have lust, greed, pride, envy, 
gluttony, sloth, or wrath, excess anger. Um, yeah, okay. But turning to a blind kind of Christianity that's anti-science and not trying to create institutions, laws, or tax system that would minimize these vices is just gonna lead to a society that triggers these vices. So if people feel like their boss makes 300 times more money than they do instead of 60 times, they're not gonna put in the effort that sloth, right? So there's so many ways you can structure a society to, to lead to less of the vices as opposed to wiping out the vices. And then if you ignore it, money sticks to money and the vices will get worse. Greed will get worse. Pride will get worse. Sloth will get worse. Gluttony will get worse because the profit motive has destroyed our, our diets, right? To make money, companies put uh, corn syrup, you know, they appeal to our sweet, salt, and fat. We don't need sweet, salt, and fat. And so we have to choose, but um, the profit motive aggravates those vices. And um, that's why every step of the way, we have to figure out the best system of regulated capital, capitalism. We can't have unregulated capitalism. That led to the huge gap between the rich and the poor in Europe that led to Marxist revolutions in the first place because people were so desperate, they had nothing to lose. So if we, if we don't regulate capitalism, we'll end up with more and more instability. And then we'll have more and more, I mean, we're more likely to have the civil war between the rich and the poor, which never comes out well, because the poor always end up getting even less than they had before. So um, you can find, more of these documents if you want that are anti-humanist and you can decide you know if you think they're fair so i did have the student research i gave examples of what students have done before um, the articles that they've picked and there's a lot of things to think about there and then then the document for the Wednesday's class, it says America returned to God. So this was after 9-11. Um, I have some quotes. Jerry Falwell, I really believe that the pagans, the abortionists, the feminists, the gays, and the lesbians who are actively trying to make that an alternative lifestyle, I point the finger in their face and say, you helped this to happen. Um, Pat Robertson, you say you're supposed to be nice to the Episcopalians. Incidentally, the signers of the Declaration of Independence, 85 of them were Episcopalians. <laughs> One was Baptist. I think there was a Methodist, but I mean, okay. So in the name of patriotism and Christianity, and um, Pat Robertson says, you say you're supposed to be nice to the Episcopalians and the Presbyterians and the Methodists and this, that, and the other. Nonsense, I don't have to be nice to the spirit of the Antichrist. So all the churches that unite reason and faith, they're called mainline churches, are now called the Antichrist. All right, the whole liberal arts college tradition is based on those those churches are the ones that founded liberal arts colleges. The Presbyterians founded Lyon College. The Methodists founded the school that I went to. Um, but every one of the schools is founded by some denomination that thought reason and faith were united. And now they're called the Antichrist by a leader of the Baptist church that has over 50% of the population, I think. Um, the, 
Our goal is a Christian nation. We have a biblical duty. We are called by God to conquer this country. We don't want equal time. We don't want pluralism. Uh, yeah, that, that is not what the founders, <clears throat> the founders really were radical, open-minded pluralists. Um, the next page is God is not a Republican or a Democrat. And it does give a list of the different issues on either side. So that's another way of looking at it. Then there's Mr. Huckabee. He stick to his values. Huckabee urges the Christian right. So I, it's hard to read. So I typed it up and we can talk about that. Um, he ran for president um, and he talks about traditional marriage and free enterprise. The, the Christian right is completely in love with capitalism. They just constantly emphasize it because that's where all their political campaign money comes from. And they do get a lot of money for saying that. Um, okay. And it's also pro-militarism. You can't cut back on the military. Well, okay, as I said, per person, we spend $2,200 per person for military. We spend $35 per person for the um, dip diplomacy, Secretary of State, the State Department. We spend substantially less than that for the intelligence community, the CIA and the FBI. So if you want to prevent war, you have to have diplomacy and you have to have intelligence. So when the diplomats go to negotiate, they know they can find out from the FBI and the CIA and the intelligence community if this country is actually telling the truth. So they all work together. And the military people at the top know that and they work together. But the economy, you know, the amount of funding that goes to one rather than the other is just a huge difference. Um, and there's just things like, okay, is it statism to have a department of labor, to have some minimum job, to have safety and health uh, laws so that the job you get doesn't make you sick or kill you, right? Should there be a law? Well, in Alabama, they passed a law saying that if a worker gets killed or hurt on the job, the company doesn't have to report it. <laughs> so obviously you're, you're making the law worthless, right? No one is ever gonna know. So there's a federal law against that, but you can write laws that will make it impossible to enforce the federal laws because you won't know. Um, whistleblower laws. If your company is breaking the law, should you be able to report them without losing your job? That's the Department of Labor. Retraining for people who lose their jobs and they need to be trained in a job that there are in the skills for a job that actually exists because of the changing economy. That's the Department of Labor. What about returning veterans? training programs for veterans so they can get jobs. Do we want that? Um, there's just, if you went through the list of every cabinet and what the cabinet does, I truly think most Americans would say, well, yeah, I want that. And then I say, are you willing to pay $35 for all of those services? Yeah, okay, so what's the problem? Well, the problem is this rhetoric about statism and humanists and how awful they are. So, so I, I just, I cannot believe that we can't have a ninth grade civics class or a 12th grade civics class where you just literally find out what the cabinet is, what it does, how much it costs, and then who Reagan appointed to those positions, what they did with it, who 
Jimmy Carter appointed, who um, George H.W. Bush appointed, who Clinton appointed, who W. Bush appointed, who Obama appointed. If you just look at all that and you just analyze just the facts, I think we could get over the ideology, the culture war, okay? As I said in class, right? Department of Energy, person in charge, PhD in physics. Anyway, that's on the last video. You don't, you don't need me to repeat it. It's just, then you should know how many of, how many people in those positions have ever been indicted, right? Criticized for breaking the law or abusing their power. So you should go all the way back to Reagan. How many people were, um, there's a, a attorney general, no, inspector general to, to check on whether these people are abusing power. The inspector general, if they suspect it, they take it to the Department of Justice. How many people have been suspected and, and the case has been taken to the Department of Justice? And then what does the Department of Justice do about it? I do think you should know that. Um, so then there's an article about um, the laws in Indiana. And again, this is religious believers have won a cascading array of rights, privileges, and exempt, exemptions from laws and duties. So you can look at that and see what you think. It's part of the culture war. Bill O'Reilly, uh, long ago, this is 2007, which in the historical view is not very long ago, John McCain was running for president. And he asks, um, they want to break down the white Christian male power stru structure, which you're a part of, and so am I, and they want to bring in millions of foreign nationals to basically break down the structure we have. Um, so, and it's about immigration, and I think it's fine to have reasonable immigration policies. The Democrats have wanted reasonable policies. Um, I, I the, the Congress has passed, has passed it, but again, there are politicians who get votes from not solving that problem. So do you wanna vote for someone who gets votes from not passing immigrant reasonable immigration legislation? Or do you want to solve the problem? Here's Laura Bush in January 2001, right? A few matter of months before 9-11. She says Roe versus Wade should not be overturned. Um, Laura Bush said that while she thinks more can be done to limit the number of abortions, she does not believe Roe versus Wade ruling should be undone. I don't think it should be overturned. So what happened after 9-11? She was told, you don't talk like that anymore, right? So, so the culture wars is with us and it's gonna crank up a lot. It's gonna get worse before the next election. Um, the latest you know, buzzwords are critical race theory, I have followed that issue. It's actually something you learn in law school. So technically, when people talk about it, it's not at all what critical race theory is, right? So what it's often referred to is any sort of teaching of American history that would uncover, talk about Juneteenth, like what is it? So I personally have started to realize what a biased view of history I, I got growing up. What is it that's not in the history books? And in a lot of ways, they're getting worse. And then the 25% of Arkansans don't even go to public school and they can order whatever history book they want. And if they want a book that says God intervened to just in the Spanish Armada to destroy the ships, so that Protestantism would prevail, well, it's a free country. You can teach your kid that. Like you can teach your kid anything. 
in the name of freedom. So I do think that our founders would be appalled. That I can say because of who they were and what I, they had in mind when they founded the country. And we read about that, right? We read about the founders, the virtue of an educated voter. So someone who learns that kind of history is not an educated voter. Um, they did interview a woman in Arizona who said, we believe that God works through wicked people. So we believe God is working through Donald Trump. Um, our founders, <laughs> that's exactly <laughs> what they were afraid of. Um, and I'm afraid of it too. I'm a philosophy teacher, so philosophers are always afraid of stuff like that. Um, but it's up to you. Um, and I, I mean, you know, if you want to defend, if you want to be critical of humanists and humanism, I, you know, that's fine. I want you to just give good arguments, not arguments that have no foundation. And then if you want, if, I mean, I can understand being critical of liberals because I don't agree with a whole lot of modern and postmodern liberals. I like the tradition, the Martin Luther King Small Liberal Arts College tradition. And you can disagree with it, but you're at a school where I represent it and I embrace it. And I, I, you know, I can be honest as a person and represent the institution at the same time. And I, even though what I've just read you, sometimes I think it sounds really biased, but it is coming from the point of view of small liberal arts and why our founders established these schools. So I think that's where what appears to be biased is just speaking in the voice of the tradition of liberal education and of what you have to have to preserve a democracy. So um, I think I'm being, I mean, fair to opposing points of view, right? Well, there are good ways to criticize liberals and we can get into that and that's fine. And I'm sure I will agree with a lot of criticisms because I really am not a postmodern liberal, a deconstruction liberal, and neither were our founders. Um, all right. So the next section I want to talk about is Confucius. And I did have you reading the first part of that chapter. So what we're going to talk about is the wisdom traditions. And all of these traditions, ancient traditions, um, it was Westerners that labeled Hinduism a religion. It, the Hindus, people in India didn't think of Hinduism as a religion. They thought of it as a way of life. And it was about the spiritual side of life, which was more important than physical. And then Buddhists didn't, for them, it was a way of life. It was not a religion. And in Confucius, it's a way of life. It's not a religion. But Westerners, as a part of colonialism, they were progressive and they were science and they were only Christianity could unite with science. And so these are religions, which mean they're backward, which justifies our domination over you and why you should try to be like us. So, so I'm not going to call them religions because they're not. And I am teaching them in a world philosophies class because that's what they are. Their worldviews and their ways of life. Ancient worldviews are about a way of life. So um, Confucius came of age at a time when China was absolutely falling apart. And so the key is, what do you do when there's complete social chaos? And this is, I like Houston Smith because everything he says, there's patterns. So of course, after 9-11, we thought that was pretty bad and everything had fallen apart. Or after the 
economic collapse, but especially 9-11. How did we deal with it? Well, we didn't deal with it very well. We allowed it, we allowed politicians to divide us internally, and we should not have done that. There, one of the articles I assigned to you was about that, was that Bush had this opportunity to bring us together and it wasn't working. And now you can see what actually happened. It got used to divide us. Uh, and if you think about, we had this opportunity to come together and then you look at where we are, it's agonizing to somebody who lived through it. But anyway, so, um, so the framework is that there was evolution, you know, we're in the midst of the social evolution. And most of the time, most people have been bound together by custom. Children learn by imitation and habit. Uh, they're not aware of the power of choice. They inherit power. Um, that they just have absorbed tradition as second nature. And that's what uh, China was obviously good at because they are the country that unifies and everybody works together. Of course, there's a limit to how much any American would want to do that, right? So when um, people were calling for people to wear masks, people social distancing, the uh, what schools and businesses and government to close down people to go online. People were furious in a lot of places like Michigan, they stormed the Capitol and um, these health care workers who really wanted people to be more careful, people who stood up for what the government was saying, people would yell at them and say, why don't you go to China? You know, it wasn't just because China was supposedly where it started. It was also because the Chinese government could make people do, <laughs> you know, just tell them you're staying home and they stay home, you know. So um, China has had this tradition, but how did that start? Well, they had collapsed. And the period of the warring states was a period of mass slaughter. And Houston Smith says that people would cook, um, people, the conquered were boiled to death and then the relatives were forced to drink the soup, right? I mean, that's, a, that's pretty low, right? I don't know how much lower you can get. So there's this chaos. And then the question is, when civilization collapses, what are the options, right? And I'm gonna ask each of you, right? Each of you has to answer that. Um, one answer is realism, use force, right? Force, strong laws, military uh, system of rewards and punishment. You assume people are evil and you have to force them to obey. And that worked for one generation. And then people sort of get tired of getting treated that way. So it might work for a while. Everybody, you have to follow the leader because we don't want that chaos. But then after a while, it's like, wait a sec. <laughs> you know, I think they're in love with their power. There's no need. You know, they forget that there was a need for it. And they rebelled. But the trouble is that goes from one extreme to the other. Confucius disagreed with that. The other one is universal love. So this is the 60s, right? All you need is love and all that wonderful stuff. Um, and so that was what they advocated. And Confucius said, no, that's too idealistic, right? So, uh, and then Confucius, um, he said he probably considered what our founding fathers established America on. This is important. Again, I've been talking about it probably way too much. But the US founders created a society from scratch. It was the most traditional traditionless society history had ever known. Okay, as an alternative to tradition, the US proposed reason and, and uh, the Jefferson Enlightenment faith on which the United States was founded. So the reason part was the citizenship 
consciousness and the town hall meetings. People could act on reason. As a, they, they left Europe, they've been ripped apart from all those customs and habits. They can have their churches, but when they're as acting as citizens, they have to use their consciousness of their reason and then their capable, their ability to be practically wise. Um, and Confucius rejected that. So his solution was what he calls deliberate tradition, <laughs> which is a contradiction. He started a series of traditions and he was always saying back in the good old days, the Chinese, the golden age. So he's just telling people, this is not Chinese, right? China is this wonderful good old days. Well, do Americans do that? Do they talk about the good old days, right? I think they do. I think in every country they tend to because people don't wanna deal with complexity, especially when after World War II, we had two thirds of the world market. That was not gonna last. We don't have it anymore. There's not gonna be any good old days. So we have to deal with what we have. But anyway, so Confucius was able, he was a, a social genius, okay? He was able to weave people together based on this image. If you're Chinese, the good old days, you act this way and you respect your parents and all this wonderful stuff. And so he created this, um, he brought people together. It was really amazing, right? He's a social genius. He was brilliant about focusing on human relationships and getting this whole system of getting people to um, treat each other well. So um, I do want you to respond to that. Um, so you will have, we'll have at least two rounds of three, two rounds of responses. One about the Black Lives Matter and one about what you read about Confucius. Um, and you can also think about the debate between humanism and the Christianity that we have now is really a debate between two extremes, right? Of what um, Houston Smith talks about, the founding fathers believed in reason, but they also, it was Christian humanism, but that emphasis on reason. And then the, the people reacting against it are at the other extreme, right? Religion without science and without social science, right? And without weaving people together with institutions and laws. So um, that's just called statism, right? So Confucius is definitely between those. So you could say Chinese people do not think the way American people think. But as soon as you know that, you can start thinking about how they think. And you can start building bridges and creating arguments for what's good about that, what's bad. Because we are going to have a big economic war between us and the Chinese during your lifetime. So it is important not to demonize the Chinese. And it's important to know, you know, their Confucian background because they went through that period of communism. But Mayo, Mayo's little red book, Mayo knew the psyche of the Chinese. And so he was really just a substitute Confucius. He acted like Confucius. Mayo's little red book had these little anecdotes, just like Confucius Analects. It was full of little Analects. <laughs> he presented himself like that. I mean, he understood his culture. Um, so Confucius' life is very interesting. He, when he died, he thought he had failed. He always wanted to be hired as a political advisor. He was a great teacher. So this is so much like Socrates, I think. And I also think it's like Jesus. So in the section where you do read about Confucius and his life, we will go over the all of Aristotle's virtues. And you can think did Confucius have these virtues, right? He stood up to the authorities. 
he got punished. He and his disciples had to hightail it out of there. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I think after a while, you're going to go, why is this so complicated? But that's why I went through that humanism thing here, because we have polarized our country seriously, and it's completely unnecessary. And our founders, as you will see for Thursday's class, they liked Confucius. They knew that we had to combine the belief in reason and minimal government with a culture that developed the virtues. So there was the Ethical Virtue Society. I mean, it's just amazing. Benjamin Franklin, our founders, were very much into that. So it, if you can imagine if every school, K through 12 colleges, taught the basic tradition the way our founders would have wanted it to be taught, we would not have what we have. And there's always opportunities, like right after 9-11, we could have come together. All right, so I want you to think about that because you have the next 50 years, there are gonna be a lot of watershed moments. I want you to think, what is my position? Am I a humanist? Am I a Christian that'll focus on the next life? Or am I a Christian humanist? Or I, am I spiritual? You know, you really need to work that out because in Black Lives Matter, we have this polarization. Every, and there'll be many, many more issues that come up. And I really want Lion students to be those ones that are the truly have the liberal minds, right? So I have high expectations for you. Um.